Well, they rang me up and they said, listen, mate, we don't have a script that uh, will, you know, get to you, but we've got a concept that we think you might like. And, and I said, all right, what is it? And they said, it's Ridley Scott, it's 185 AD, and you start the movie as a Roman general. Ridley Scott's original Gladiator, winner of five Academy Awards, five BAFTAs, runner-up to the second highest grossing film of 2000, may seem like this really tight revenge narrative with a strong emotional arc and a perfect ending, and it is. At its core, the movie's story is elegantly simple and remarkably ageless. It's not overly political. It follows a single man's journey from beginning to end on a mission to avenge the death of his wife and child. But almost none of that journey, in the details where it mattered most, in the capsulation of events and moments, nor even in the dialogue that is best remembered, existed on the page before principal photography on the film began. Gladiator is a hundred million dollar movie whose script was constructed almost entirely on set in real time. What I wasn't confident about with Gladiator was the world that was surrounding me. At the core of what we were doing was a great concept, but the script, it was rubbish. The studio think they have a script, right? Um, and other producers think they have a script, but when Ridley and I sat down together and we went through it page by page, and we marked stuff that made no sense or that was silly. They ended up with almost nothing, about 30 pages of actual shootable scenes. Yeah, it might have actually been 22 <laughs> now that I think about it. Yeah. If you find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face, do not be troubled, for you are in Elysium, <laughs> and you're already dead! Now, I want to lay the foundation a bit before I get into specifics. Essentially, it went like this. David Franzoni, who had just written Amistad for Steven Spielberg, sold the idea of Gladiator back in the 90s, enough to get the project greenlit. He then wrote his first complete draft of the film in 1997. Ridley Scott signed on to direct it, only he hated the script. So Scott then brought on writer John Logan, Casino Royale, Skyfall, to fix it specifically reworking most of the central act and maybe most significantly introducing the death of Maximus's family as a motivation for the entire film. Not so insignificant. Anyway, that pretty much resulted in the 20 to 30 pages of Gladiator that Scott and Crow liked, they say no. which they quickly burned through in the first couple of weeks of shooting. So still unsatisfied, William Nicholson, another writer, was brought on to rewrite as they went. He focused largely on making the character of Maximus more sensitive and relatable, beefing up his relationship with Juba, introducing the whole afterlife aspect, and ultimately turning the movie away from just a revenge flick led by a typical bitter, vengeful action hero, to a sentimental journey about a man who lives in hope, who is at peace with the sacrifice he'll have to make to see his family again, and who doesn't succumb to the typical Hollywood hero endings of the time. I mean, that's all huge. And those are just the changes Nicholson introduced. Are you not entertained? While filming. Are you not entertained? However, we were making a movie that grew as we made the movie. And little things became big ideas. And we were being fluid within that gigantic hundred plus million dollar budget shape, which is all about schedules and disciplines and being exact about things, even down to, you know, this one conversation. Ridley wanted to shoot me doing this after battle prayer and amongst the trinkets on the shelf that the art department had left there, they had these little figurines. So I, I picked up these figurines and, and like directed a prayer towards them as if they were my wife and child. That ends up becoming this huge story point, but it was like that was created on the night. Cicero. This is one of my favorite examples because just how big a knock-on effect that one decision would have on the story wouldn't be felt until months later into production. Basically, the character of Proximo originally was supposed to have the last words in the film. A wooden sword. Bearing his sword symbolizing his freedom in the arena where Maximus fell. But when the actor who played him, Oliver Reed, died three weeks before the end of production, that tribute was passed on to Jaimon Hansu's character, Juba. And instead of a sword, it was these figurines, Maximus's wife and child. In the river, 
which not only is thematically more interesting, and not only is Juba the character in the story that Maximus has conversations about death and mortality with, you believe you'll see them again when you die. Putting a button on that, they will not die for many years. It's a moment and a solution that wouldn't have been conceivable were it not that. Well, A, Gladiator was shot largely in chronological order, which is what allowed the story to be developed on set and in real time in the first place, but B, that a gut decision made 18 weeks earlier at the start of production could set the groundwork to make such a beautiful and unplanned ending possible. That's the power of improvisation, the power of subtext, the power of thematic storytelling, something that can exist on the page but ultimately has to be brought out by the director and the actors. Are you ready to do your duty for Rome? And I'm going to focus on that a lot more in my next episode. I'm sort of sticking to surface stuff today, but all of it, Ridley Scott's direction, his vision, the ending, Oliver Reed's death and how they dealt with it. That is nothing. I'll get to it because it's really fascinating. The, the narrative is complete. In, on the page, or the potential of that narrative is so clear that you can take the risk that you'll grind it together and you'll find it, you know. Now, it wasn't just big narrative stuff that needed so much revision, or that people remember. Gladiators. It was the dialogue. I salute you. And I can't stress it enough, for everything Nicholson brought to the table, Scott and Crow still hated the dialogue, and a lot of the lines that were kept, that are frankly pretty cheesy on paper, I'm required to kill, so I kill. Only work because you had this brilliant cast there to sell it. I did not say I knew him, I said he touched me on the shoulder once. Anywhere they could though, the actors, oh, yeah. rewrote on the spot. Oh yes, I remember. And we got some of the film's best lines out of it. Your false as a son is my failure. As a father. That line came up with it between takes. A perfect pinning to that scene makes the patricide moments later all the more bitter. The phrase strength and honor. Strength and honor. Strength and honor. Strength and honor. One of the key lines in the film. Crow came up with it based on an old school motto. Maximus's description of his home. Kitchen garden. It smells of herbs in the day. Jasmine in the evening. Based on Russell Crowe's real home in Australia. Am I not merciful? That line was also ad-libbed, and Connie Nielsen's response to it genuine. Am I not merciful? But actually, though Phoenix says the line twice, those were done as two different takes of the same line and just combined in the edit. And then one example of a line that wasn't changed, that Nicholson wrote that Crow hated, but said anyway because he couldn't think of anything better in the moment, believe it or not, was this line. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Hey, cheesy or not on paper, they're just those really cinematic moments, you know, that just make you feel good. Gladiator is full of moments and lines like these, and they do not undersell the movie at all. But anyway, that's just screenplay. As I said, I'm going to come back to Gladiator next time to talk about Sort of the other side of the coin to all this, the visual side, the language of film, the notion that movies aren't built entirely from the page anyway. They're constructed through expression, through blocking, nonverbal language. It's something I've talked about before. A few months back, I made a video on some of the ways in which Star Wars started out as a prominently visual film, akin to the early silent era movies, about just how well the original trilogy was designed to play without any dialogue at all, thanks to the performances, the music. Of course, you can no longer watch that video on YouTube because of a broken copyright system, but you can now go check it out exclusively and ad-free over on Nebula. If you don't already know, Nebula is a creator-built, creator-owned streaming platform. It has no ads, no clutter, and is home not only to Nebula original programming, like seriously, go check out Bro Deschanel's exclusive series Taboo on Screen, breaking down how various societal taboos are depicted in filmmaking, because it's brilliant but also tons and tons more exclusive, extended, and early content from other film essays you know, including Thomas Flight, like Stories of Old, The Closer Look, and, as of recently, 
me. Subscribing to me on Nebula not only means supporting me, my work, and the videos I want to make in a more sustainable way, it also means access to most of my content early, watching all my videos in their entirety without ads, and like with my Star Wars video, access to episodes that are no longer available here on this platform. If you join Nebula with my code, you can get 40% off a year's subscription, which comes out to just 36 bucks for the year, if you go to go.nebula.tv slash cinemasticks. I'm Danny Boyd. I'll see you there.